Fathers in the church will help. Fathers in the church are not a replacement for natural fathers. Mm -hmm. Like God's design cannot um, be ignored or disregarded without consequence. I don't care if you're talking to a purple hair feminist or a guy that could bench press 400 pounds. Everyone's saying the same thing, that our young men in this country, they're not doing well. Now some are comfortable being a feminist, but many are looking for guys. There's these guys that tell them the truth, that there was a world before feminism, and this is how women work. And some of it's good, a lot of it's really bad. And when they take that red pill and see the world for what it is, they get angry. They get angry because I won't be able to have what my father, my grandfather had. Yeah, you had a bad deal, and these things aren't all your fault, but you're still responsible for your response to the time that God has put you. So we want to help you to pave a way forward. We're going where Nehemiah took the people of Israel. They didn't rebuild Jerusalem tonight, but they were able to rebuild a wall. Together, we're going to fight with God against the sin in our own heart, the sin in this world, and we're going to be the men He made us to be. So let's do it. So it's good to have you here, Michael. Uh, you're here in Moscow putting the finishing touches on the documentary. It's good yep. to be a man. I understand. Is as it? Have you got the final finishing touch? Your, your part? Uh, this is it. We're we're uh, crossing the finish line right now. Okay, very good. So um, it's good to be a man. That makes me think of it's good to be a boy. It's good to be a young man. It's good to be a middle-aged man. It's good to be an old man. But the goods that are represented there can be very, very different, mm. right? Vintages of wine. <laughs> Vintages of wine. And then vinegar at the end. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. So um, I thought it would be, it'd be good for us to talk about uh, if men assuming their responsibilities as men called by God um, is sort of a, a glue that holds things together, mm -hmm. that uh, without that kind of leadership and men taking responsibility, things tend to fall apart. They just tend to uh, uh, disintegrate. Um, but when men take responsibility, that doesn't make life simple. That doesn't make it easy. Okay. And one of the challenges that we have is, in, as I see it, in our generation is uh, the challenge of cross-generational communication. Absolutely. Is that, yeah. is that fair? I think that's fair. Um, so... Uh, well, first, give me some of your observations of um, young men staring at boomers incomprehensible, you know, without, <laughs> without comprehension. And then as a boomer, I'll uh, maybe uh, make some observations the other direction. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the tension's real and, and it's, it's intense. And it's really across every sort of part of society as you can think. I think, um, first off, just the boomers came into a world of, of, of wealth because of what happened after World War II in America. And, uh, but also a lot of crazy things happened during their lives, but they didn't feel the full effect of them, mm -hmm. at least not in the prime of their life. All so right. you had things like the sexual revolution starting in Bloomington, Indiana with Kenzie, but working its way out through the 50s and 60s and really blowing up in the 70s where right. you get contraceptive, integrated workforce, no fault divorce, and um, then you get into the 80s, and even in the 80s, you know, I was born in 1980, and even in the 80s, it wasn't that common to have kids with divorced parents. You had a couple, mm -hmm. but by the end of the 80s into the 90s, it was it was very common right. to have a lot of um, untraditional families, right? right. Uh, people living together with kids and a lot of mixed families. That sort of bready bunch was the more wholesome take on what soon yeah. became the norm. Um, then if you wanted to get pornography, or you wanted to do illicit sex, you, you had to take real risk back in the day. You had to go to a bad part of town or whatever. Right. Or you had to take the risk of buying it with your credit card and be mailing to your house and your wife going out and saying, what's mm. in this brown paper bag? Right. right? Well, you know, starting in the 2000s, you were able to get it much more easy. And now uh, you can stumble onto high def free pornography on your phone mm -hmm. very easily. Right? right. And so that generation uh, that the boomer generation had some protection still. And it was good. It was good that they had it. Their, their parents had seceded in a lot of ways. They were it, prod the prodigal son who had not yet run out of money. That's right. They had it, yeah. And, and, and then it, now we're feeling it. We're feeling right. it big. And I, I noticed something happened 
it's like late 2000s into 2010s. There was an explosion. You even saw the university. When I went to university, I went in 1999, and it was still all about, you know, challenging, you know, the status quo and going after truth and all that. And then just 10 years later, don't say anything that might hurt people's feelings. That was not the ethic, even among the pagans right. um, at the university. So things really started to change. And now people have, uh, are starting to wake up to how destructive these cultural sins are and they're like how'd this happen well right. it happened on your watch and they're looking back and pointing at them and they're, they're right. angry that they don't have a world um that their their parents had that they're they're kind of their parents um bought the food but now they have to pay the bill you know right. okay so i was born in 50 1953 which makes me right in the middle of the boomer back right and just to key off a few things you said, when I was a kid, I didn't know anybody whose parents were divorced. I'm, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there were some, but it was mm -hmm. just it was just not a thing. Uh, families were intact. I grew up, and and we had a I grew up in a Christian home, and we had Christian values, and there there were secular families out there, but there was a recognizable Middle America mm -hmm. that was intact and wealthy. Right, um, uh, on the rise the american dream was not an ironic joke you could buy a house have a car right start a job in your early late teens early 20s and be able to take care of a family more right. or less and and so what you're describing is um uh very much the case and i remember uh, a long time as an adult a married adult uh, with no internet and didn't yep. <laughs> didn't exist so when I first started making books, I would, when uh, when I got my first computer, it was an IBM XT, and it had ten megabytes of memory, wow. hard drive memory, it's a calculator. which I thought was <laughs> cavernous, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely cavernous. And uh, I, if I type some type something up, I had to put it on a floppy disk, take it down to a shop downtown, and they would typeset it for you. And, it, and then to make a book, I would. It, they'd give me a roll of wax paper with the thing on it, and I would uh, uh, a special kind of paper that I would wax at a waxer, wax the back of it. I'd cut it up in pieces and later that's how you made books back in the day. And it was much closer to Gutenberg than. <laughs> it's a, than, than it it was. does sound like like wow, I didn't know Doug was that old. But, you know? but yeah, I, I really, well, it's uh, remarkable how fast everything's changed. But yeah. the thing that's striking to me about the the tension that that the phrase okay boomer represents mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. that tension was our generation the boomer generation invented generational rebellion yeah right so uh, our generation revolted against the previous generation the world war ii uh, greatest generation. stoic generation yeah right so uh, that rebellion in the 60s was very much um uh, uh our contribution to this and God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows, mm -hmm. right? So what's happening now is the boomers saying, this is not, it's not fair. The, these young punks, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> they, they are punks. They are. Well, but, think, yeah. think back there. There was an era when you were the, at peak punk, punkery, yeah. right? You, yep. you were doing your thing. Uh, if you say, well, that's not fair what they're doing to us now. Yeah. But was it fair what you were doing yeah. Back then. That's right. Uh, and this is one of the things that, uh, speaking pastor to pastor here, it seems to me that one of the things we have to do is learn how to broker a gospel centered peace mm. between generations in the church. Yes. As a, as a incubation point for mm -hmm. enabling uh, the elderly and the young to worship together and to be knit together. That's yes. part of God's design. Mm hmm. I love that part in, um, I guess it's Nehemiah, right? Where they set the, it's Nehemiah or Ezra, where they set the foundation of the temple and the young people are like excited and the old people who knew what the temple used to look like <clears throat> are kind of crying, right? right? And the, the internet though, now you can kind of look back and see the world that once was just Google, yeah. you know, vintage footage from 1940 and yeah. there's like <laughs> hours of it on YouTube. But you know, that's the highlights. 
That's like that's what social media is the highlights. Right. You know, when I put um, I put all the pictures of my vacation, I didn't put my daughter like you know having a diaper that exploded up her back or something. I'm mm-hmm. not, that's not. It's all the good stuff, and so they see the good. There was bad stuff back then, right? And and just helping people see like this is uh, if you treat your parents this way as your your parents treated their parents, what do you think's coming to you? Yeah. I mean, who's going to break the cycle at some point? You have to take responsibility, and I think that's what both generations have to do. Boomers need to be willing to say, "Yeah, yeah, we're we're reaping what we sowed," right? You know, but learn from us. Yeah, and me, uh, yeah. so, um, the first commandment with a promise is honor your father and mother. And I would say, I would argue that generational respect is in a fallen world has always been difficult. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. always been a challenge. Yes, right. Uh, you always have to teach kids how to honor their parents and you have to um, teach parents how to not suffocate your kids with Mm -hmm. advice or, uh, you know, bury them in counsel and that sort of thing. Uh, So I think in a fallen world, that's always been a challenge, but it seems in our time, it's exacerbated by the idea that the modern idea is that each decade is like a separate pond. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you live around your pond, you, you, the pond of the 50s and the pond of the 60s and the pond of the 70s. Yep. And now we're in a, in a new pond and it's a new world. But it's actually a river, right? And you can go upstream and you're, everybody's going downstream. And we can, we're all by the same river. And everything each, each generation does has an impact on what the next generation mm-hmm. is going to have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Uh, So what the boomers have done is what we hand on to the subsequent generations. And what they are doing is going to be handed on to to their kids who will be resentful or not, depending on whether they're discipled in Mm -hmm. how Christ would have us live. My dad, um, my dad loved me, never didn't love me. He didn't grow up as a Christian, but he's felt, you know, he's in his 60s now and kind of. Uh, we had a, my my younger brother died of uh, drug, more or less a drug overdose this past year, and and that hit my parents hard. And my dad was very apologetic for the way we grew up. And I just told him, Dad, I forgave you a long time ago, right? Mm. Like I don't hold that against you. Like you you had a bad dad, and you gave me what you had, and you yeah. got you got the ball as far down the field as you could. It wasn't at, that far, but you gave me your love right. and you gave me your approval, and I, I forgive you for that. And I know I'm going to fail my children. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I'm forgiving you. It's kind of a selfish forgiveness. Like, I'm going to pay it forward. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm forgiving you because I really do love you. And I know you, you did what you could. And now that I'm older and, uh, and being a good dad and being a good husband, it's hard, right? right. And, uh, but I want my children to see me forgive their grandfather. I want them to see me extend that because I'll need – I, I have blind spots, Right, mm-hmm. and this generation has is so angry. The younger generation, you see that. Like you'll have these guys that will um, just go nuts over not having mentors. No one wants to mentor me. Okay, what does mentor mean? So they describe it. It sounds like a dad. Like I yeah. can't get together with you a couple hours every week and talk mm-hmm. about all your problems all the time. Like not mm-hmm. a bunch of you. You know, yeah. um, come to the Lord's Lord's Day service. We'll we'll talk there. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, then uh, then when you do give them counsel, they spurn it. And they right. say, oh, that's just you're blinded because you're older. And I'm like, I'm only 43, man. <laughs> like, like, come on. It's starting to happen it's to you. It's starting to like, you know, it's okay, Jax, I guess, right? But yeah, they, they are, um, they need, there's a need for, like you said, gospel-centered um, kind of peace to be brokered here and understanding you have to forgive as you're forgiven. And that, yeah, the, your parents did fail you, but are you going to stay stuck on that? Are you going to stay a victim forever as pointed at other people? Because right now, that's all you're doing. You're not doing anything. Right. You're just complaining. You're not building anything. You're not trying to fix anything. And I, I like the post-exilic books in Scripture for right now. Right. You know, that's it, it kind of captures where we're at, at least in America, where um, we have lost the culture war at a national level for a time, for a time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and now we're in a kind of a rebuilding phase. At the county level. <laughs> at the county, yeah. We just got to put our yeah. county before country. Um, anyway. Right. So... Uh, let's talk uh, for a minute about uh, distinguishing between uh, what you might call pure generational perspective and um, actual cultural differences. Mm. So, so there's the there's the 17 year old who doesn't understand the 37 year old. 
Yeah, right. And that's always the case. Just because experience. Yeah, yeah you, you've you've not been married. You don't don't know what it's like to have little kids, and that that experience is going to be constant in every generation. But then when it comes to things like music or literature or painting or whatever, yeah. um, you can have you're you've moved fr from an area where the experience is constant to a situation where. One generation's music might be objectively better than another one. <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, as much as it pains me to say it, Bach is better than Leonard Skinner. Let's say I would agree. <laughs> and Leonard Skinner is better than what they're doing now. <laughs> 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 so, uh, how do you uh, how do you navigate the the old people, older people, getting their back up over uh, you know uh, dress or and there's some some aspects of it would be oh look people are different generations are different. right wide ties skinny ties R right who does god really care about wide ties skinny ties no. but at some point the the rebellion and the father hunger and the you know when you have a tarantula tattooed on your right cheek maybe that says something spiritual right it does uh, yeah. um, so how do you where, where do you draw the cultural lines how, yeah how do you do that what's well, it is difficult. It is interesting if you are kind of on the social media space, you just have to take that for what it is. It's a splice of cultures, the people that decided to go online and share all their thoughts, mm -hmm. right? That's a that's a certain type of person already. Yeah, not everybody right? does that. <clears throat> and you don't want to treat that as the population, but a sample of the population. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting that the younger generations uh, are rebelling against tattoos and earrings and uh, like really long hair on men, and really short hair on right. women. And they're actually starting to hunger for things that's more wholesome because it's kind of intuitive at one level. That's mm -hmm. it's not right. It, it doesn't make sense. You know, yeah. it's, there's something undignified about it. And I think they are, their eyes are being opened. So I think maybe what's happened, like take like uh, my generation really screwed up with screens. And we're the first generation to have like iPads and, and iPhones while we were parenting. And so our generation, like we got the kid in the tub and we're like typing away on our phone, right? Mm -hmm. Where just a little, just a few years before that, you'd watch the kid talk, make jokes, like mm -hmm. have a little duck doing things. In the, and uh, this, this generation that's like, say, you know, 25 and down, they grew up with parents ignoring them. Do that. Right, ignoring them because they're on their phone. They kind of have a hatred towards screens, a resentment. And uh, and I've had my, my own son tell me, hey, would you put that down? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, angers me, but mm -hmm. it's right. He's right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think some of the things that we used to have to convince people of being bad is now it's just becoming clear it's bad. Is it is it the case? I, so I remember okay. when when I was a when I was a kid learning the etiquette of answering a telephone. Oh yeah, they don't get that. Uh, okay, um, you when you call someone, you let it ring six times. Uh, yeah. When the call comes in, you say Wilson's Douglas speaking. Yeah. You know, all the, well, it's like a new technology is introduced. And then everybody scrambles until the etiquette catches up with it. Yes. Right. I think that's what's going on. Right. Postman and, then, and Alul talks about this quite a bit. Right. So then you have with the uh, smartphones and uh, email protocols, mm -hmm. you know, email comes in and it takes a, takes a few years before. The rules of emailing yes catch up yeah. right and i think we're moving perhaps into a uh and and now <laughs> you you just figure out email and everybody talks via text yes and, yes and then they talk via instagram and then they everything is just moving on and what where are the rules what are the rules i mean this is part of the problem that we have everywhere um with the younger generation is that they didn't grow up in a world that was as tactile as ours was Right, um, where you just interact with physical things all the time. The physical thing they're interacting with is some sort of device that mediates a relationship to the world and to other people. So if you want your kids to go out, so go out and play football with the kids. The kids aren't out there. They're online playing games together. You know, mm -hmm. um, and it was funny when I was a kid, because the way video games were designed, you just kind of got sick of it. And it was like, that was good. I played for a couple. My parents didn't have to send uh, set time limits on the NES system. Right. We uh, we ultimately go out and put a boat out in the Ohio, which was yeah. really dangerous, um, <laughs> or go play basketball or whatever, pick up game. Um, nowadays, the kids aren't out there. 
And uh, the, the interaction that they have with other humans is mediated. So they're not good at reading body language. I think this is part of the dating problem. They, they don't know how to read a, a woman's body language or even a man's. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I, I've hired a lot of people for different companies I worked for, and it's getting harder and harder to hire people that are good on the phone. They're very scared of talking because they can't edit it. They can't sit there and wait and think about it because you can only have so long of a pause. Before they have to think phone. on the fly. Yeah, they have to. Yeah, and they, they haven't had that sort of interaction. And and we even see this now with, uh, this is a real problem for police officers because as a police officer, you have to have one, command presence. So you carry yourself a certain way. And two, you have to read. When you're coming up, something doesn't feel right. And that guy's popped the lock on his on his gun. He's got his hand already. Why? He doesn't know. Mm -hmm. He just has his spidey senses up. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole generation that has no spidey sense, yeah. right, because of screens. And I think what older generations need to understand, I, I was talking to an older boomer pastor, one you would actually know, and he was telling me that he took these two young guys to a restaurant to introduce them to this lovely waitress there that he thought, he should go after this girl. So he brings them there, they're sitting, and he orders, and she chats back and forth with him, but the guys wouldn't say a thing. They just went, and when they said it was like awkward and kind of weird, and he's like, I'm just done with them. I'm just done with them. Like, I, I set them up. It's like T-ball. They could just hit that, and, you know, she likes me, and that's enough for her to at least consider them. Right. And, and I was like, well, have patience, because I, I don't, they're not from your world. Uh, they, don't, they don't know how to have this interaction. And you can't learn that kind of thing in one lesson. Or from a book, or from a documentary, or from a podcast. Right. Like, well, they can't yeah. learn it from, it's good to be a man. A doc, <laughs> Enough a doc. to start, but the point is you have to get real men. You have to be around, like God made us, you know, like, like what John says, I got a lot of things to say to you, but not with, um, not with ink, right, okay. face to face. So let's circle back around to something you said earlier about, I'll meet with you at church. Um, what, what can we as pastors do to, uh, or should we do anything? There's a difference between ministering to uh, Gen Xers and ministering to Zoomers and ministering to Boomers yeah. and catering to yes, so, that's a good way so to look at it. Ca yeah. catering to a certain demographic, I think, is going to be the death of your church. Yes, right. But ministering to a particular group, it ought to be the same kind of thing that ministers to everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you're preaching forgiveness of sin, the young people need that. Mm -hmm. Well, so do the old people. Yeah. So do, so do the kids. So everybody, you know, right. you're you're preaching a timeless gospel. And the Holy Spirit is faithful to give them what they can take. What they take, and so what you're doing is ministering to the people of God as the people of God, and you're not so blind. You you break it out like Paul in Ephesians says, he gives all this glorious truth for everybody, but then he says, husbands, you know, yeah, servants, wives, stations and vocation, yeah. But what he's doing is he's applying the same truth That's right. into every nook and cranny, as opposed to having a church with nothing but surfer jargon. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be a surfer church. Mm -hmm. That's catering to. And you're not going to build anything. It's going to be just a... Five-year, ten-year sort a of experiment. It's Kleenex, a yeah. Kleenex fire. Yeah. It grows and then <clears throat> dies down, as opposed to... Because a church that is going to be here in, in 150 years has to be a church where you have kids that grow up in it and stay mm -hmm. and marry and stay and bring up their kids. Yeah, I think um, what we can do is, first off, understand what they need. And <clears throat> what they want is step-by-step -step instructions. They really, they're, they're kind of risk adverse and they want to the do a good job. About, yeah, yeah, the younger generation. Uh, they're risk adverse, they want to do a good job. So they're really looking for one, one A, one B, two, mm -hmm. you know, all these little sub points. But what they need is folks that say, look, you just got to throw yourself into life, right? Here's like, let me point you the right direction. Mm -hmm. And what you're feeling is what everyone felt. Like mm -hmm. everyone feels that way. Everyone has insecurity. Everyone's like, gets scared around a woman they really like. It takes a little while to get that swagger. And mm -hmm. don't try too hard or she'll know. They right. know, right? Um, they can but, smell fear. <laughs> they can. They, <laughs> they see through it. Um, but I think part of it is what we've seen at our church because of my online rep, we've drawn some people, and the ones that do best are the ones that listen. We have an older elder at our church, and uh, and he's been very helpful for this. And because I'll spend some time with them, but I'll kind of hand them off to the 
to the elder guy and he'll just, he's kind of no nonsense, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, gives like real punchy, simple advice. And, and, and they start to get, get the sort of, we use the bike chain analogy where you put the chain on one gear and you put mm -hmm. on the other and, and by forward motion. So what I'm learning is to push these guys into doing something. Right. And, and this always happens. You give someone really good for, I'll give you three steps. Okay. Here's three steps. Well, do you have a book on that? You don't need a book. Like a book, it, it's like people. You need, you need a YouTube clip. <laughs> yeah, YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> and so there's a dopamine shot you get from when you announce what you're about to do because your brain tells you you're going to do it. So that's why people like to tell everyone, I'm going on this 30 day weightlifting plan or whatever. Uh, you're less likely to do it when you announce it than you are if you just keep it to yourself and do it. And, and I think a lot of times these guys, they, the more books they read, the more they feel like they're ready. But you know, I've been bringing up Friedman and everything I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But Friedman talks about how the generation, uh, like our culture now thinks technique and information is everything. Right. And it's, it's actually, you know, it's more of just going after it. So giving these guys really basic, you know, hey, you should dress a little bit better. Yeah. Right. You know, or yeah, go, you should go, go run or go to the gym. I don't care which one you do, but one will take a lot of stress out of you. You won't be as tempted by pornography. Um, it'll, it'll make you uh, feel better, make you look better. You know, these are the sort of things pastors have to do. So the, um, the thing you were mentioning earlier about, I want a list or a checklist, or I want someone to tell <clears throat> me what to do. Well, the, James t says, don't be a hearer of the word only, but also do the Doer. word. Yes. Because if you hear only, there's a t it says, and so deceive yourselves. If you hear only, you you th you deceive yourself into thinking that you're doing it because you're hearing it. That's right. Be because I'm he listening to good sermons on how to be a man. It's masculinity uh, by proxy. Right. So I'm I'm willing to put up with people talking about being a man. Therefore, I'm becoming a man. Mm -hmm. But it's all in the doing. It's, it's yep. in the action. So you have to go, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you have to take a step out. Well, these guys online, they're all experts on masculinity. You hear them, <laughs> right? They have all their pills arranged just right, all their categories, um, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, all, all these categories mm -hmm. they like to use. And uh, then I've had the, the privilege to meet these men and both the, the kind of influencer level that have big YouTube channels mm -hmm. and then just the consumers of it and seeing the reality, like, look, what are you doing? Like, right. you're, you're th like I've had guys tell me, I think my wife's a feminist, right? Okay, okay why is your wife a feminist? I mean, what woman isn't these days at some right. level? Like, it's in the water. What guy's not kind of effeminate? What woman doesn't have some feminism? That's sanctification. We'll work it out. But what do you, what do you mean? Well, she doesn't want to have kids. And I was like, okay. Why? Well, I told her I wanted to have 10, and she was doesn't want to have that many. And said, well, how many do you have? He said, well, we don't have any. <laughs> and I said, dude, imagine someone telling you to come to the gym and just like throwing up like 300 pounds for you to rep on the bench for the first time. I'm not mm -hmm. doing that. You know, they mm -hmm. come one at a time. So then we meet this woman, and and she's a gem. And mm -hmm. this guy just doesn't know himself. He's not self-aware. He needs other men in his life to say, yeah, you're just kind of, you, you talk a big game, but you're not doing anything. And you do understand principles, but you don't understand the way you should because you have to go do it. Yeah, you because know? biblical knowledge is incarnate. Biblical knowledge is embodied. Yes. Right. It's it, wisdom, which comes from fathers. Right. And so the, the problem is we have people that know a whole lot and can spit it out. And reform people love this. Reform people love to memorize catechisms and confessions. And I love right. them. Right. But they do they master them? So right. they they appear to look a master in in their in a way when they're judged by their ability to articulate knowledge they've consumed. Right. But when you look at the quality of their life, it's a different person. And wisdom is what you see in older men. And if you're blessed, they share it with you. Right. And we don't that's why fathers is such a key part. Of correcting this like fathers in the church will help fathers in the church are not a replacement for natural fathers mm -hmm. like god's design cannot um be ignored or disregarded without consequence right. and i realize what i learned in my 30s i should have learned in my 20s well mm -hmm. it's gonna be a, dec a decade behind right. you know what let's i am where i'm at i'm gonna move forward and i'm, and I'm growing that's this generation so you're behind don't stay behind yeah. like close the distance and and, and help your help your children you yeah know? My dad was fond of saying, God takes you from where you are, 
not from where you should have been. And yes. so where, where, where are you? Okay, instead of weeping and lamenting, okay, let's d- start doing yeah. now. Because if you don't do in the moment, you're still deceiving yourself. Mm-hmm. It, and it's got to be hands-on, embodied, actual learning. Mm-hmm. So that my image of this is my dad, I must have been well, five or six years old. My dad teaching me how to tie a necktie. And st- I remember, I still remember standing behind me. Yeah. And I'm looking, looking down. Yeah. And this is how, it, this is how it goes. Half Windsor. And w- when we were, Nancy and I were taking care of my dad, um, uh, the last four years or so, and we had caregivers coming in, okay, you know, to help with different parts of it, young man. And my dad, Brett liked to wear a necktie. He would, he would dress up, sit in his chair, necktie uh, on. But we had to, tie a bunch of ties um, and have them hanging there so the caregivers could just put it over his head and cinch it up because mm. they didn't know how to wow didn't know how to tie a necktie yeah. and and the issue is not oh that's the be all and end all skill the issue is how many boys didn't have a dad who yes. taught them anything didn't teach them how to throw a ball didn't teach them how to change the oil in the car didn't teach them how to didn't weren't weren't there and the elders in the church are not supposed to teach you how to change the oil in the car. Yeah, we're right. word and sacraments guys, and we, we do what we can because we love them. We have fellowship together like we do with all Christians. Yeah. But it's not, uh, churches aren't to have a masculinity program outside of what the Word of God accomplishes when we preach to everybody and right. minister to it from house to house and all that. But we don't run schools for men. Like, right. We're trying, but it's right. hard. You know, it's hard. That's right. our two, the things that we're up against is <clears throat> two things. Angry young men, and we're about to have a glut of old spinster women because mm-hmm. Gospel Coalition types preach the lie that you can delay getting married and singleness is awesome, and that 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 plays well in your 20s and maybe early 30s. Mm-hmm. You get to your 40s and 50s, there's no one that wants to marry you, or not very many, and we're about to have that glut. And this is, is going to face the church. It's going to be a hard, hard so thing that's coming. Angry, away. angry young men and angry middle-aged women. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, a lot yeah. of them. It's going to be a huge number. It's just it's it's happening, and we do have a responsibility. We can deduce the principle from First Timothy five, right, where the church has a if the church is to care for widows that don't have an extended family to care for them financially, it, it would follow to me that we do have to provide some sort of spiritual relational care to them in to the ability that we can if other people can we just it's a real challenge that we're up to and um so i I wrote a piece a few years ago and it was on how unwanted singleness is an affliction not a gift yes i remember that piece it's a good piece (laughs) well i it, it set some people off and because you're right that there's been sort of a concerted effort from you might mainstream big eva types to say singleness is a gift and you know let jesus be your husband and 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 it's sort of like self-interested pastors preaching series on tithing yeah all the time right well what you're doing is you're having unattached um people who can donate services to the church and Mm -hmm. help help out but you're you're making a long range demographic nightmare for them and for you. Yeah, right? it's like the church is like China when they had the one child policy. Right, like that's about to come home to roost. And I got in trouble. I, I get in trouble on occasion for things I say. And I said, "Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I've learned from the best." Um, <laughs> but uh, I I have talked about singleness and gone after it as you know it's a that's a state a temporary state in everyone's life but it's not the normative state for most people right right and and certainly not the bulk of your life a lot of us start single we end single when we lose a spouse right Mm -hmm. but it's not a normative state and i went after it and i met with a pastor who wanted to talk to me he was very mad about some of my tweets well some women were mad about my tweets and i'd asked him to talk to me and i was like well it's not really matthew 18 but that's fine we'll roll with this Mm -hmm. and i said look i'm not sorry i'm not taking them down i actually retweeted them after the meeting and I said, here's why you are not going to take responsibility for these women 20 years from now. I know you're not. Right now, this mm-hmm. is, you know, when you read First Timothy 5, it's very clear that they're being burdened mm-hmm. by the need. 
Well, and that's obviously going back to early acts right. that this is really hard to take care of those people. And I have had, uh, I've ministered to older people at a couple of churches. I've kind of ran the, the elderly group and the women in particular are lonely and they want to talk. And it's like, no matter how much time I spend with them, it's never enough. Right. right. And, and you, and they, and they learn, they yearn for just for human touch, like a hug seriously, because their husband's gone, a church full of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's the hope? Well, the hope is that we get these young men and we capture them with the truth of the gospel, the truth of scripture, mm -hmm. scripture. Here, look at all this wisdom. You want to know how to be a king? Well, read Proverbs, you know. That's kind of like a meme now. They refer to each other as kings, right? And uh, but most of them are paupers. But you don't have to stay that way. And you read this. So mm -hmm. we get those guys up and then some of these women are are good women that are repentant, just like those mm -hmm. men are repentant. They look, they see that their machoism was really the flip side of effemacy and railing about things online is kind of gay, and they're ready to step up and be a man. A man. I think we, we can't give up on a whole generation, right. and God can rebuild from ashes. The picture that Em and I had about this when we're thinking about it, my wife Emily, is we used to watch this show where they go and reclaim old wood. They go to these barns, they mm -hmm. buy it, because the wood is higher quality, because it, it, it now we like grow it so quick, it's not yeah. as good. And, and they take that old wood, and they build beautiful things from it. And that's what has to happen now. Right. Yeah, you, you guys had more sexual partners than you should have. You guys wasted very important years of your life. Yeah, you got fat at a young age, and you shouldn't have. Like I told my son, I was like, you're a little chubby, right? Mm -hmm. You can do that after you get the woman. <laughs> like, <laughs> so work on it. And he did work on it. Because like, look, I'm not saying I'm the standard here. Uh, but when I was mm -hmm. your age, you like, I could have stopped a car with my, you know, so you right. should get there. But get these guys to, to realize, yes, all these things have happened to you. Uh, but if you're able to step up now, God will, you can, there are women out there you can marry and build a beautiful future with. And I'm on top of this, the unmarried women who are in their 30s and 40s, and don't want to be, yeah. you know, uh, and don't want to be, or young men who are want 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 to marry, mm -hmm. and they're of a marriageable age, but they don't have the skill set to provide. Yeah. They're not equipped. Yes. You know, they're they've got the need to be married, and they're the right age to marry, but they've not had a dad that show, to show them how. Um, one of the things I've uh, the the counsel that comes from our modern evangelical ethos is that we'll see that we our hearts go out to these people and so we should continue to lie to them <laughs> right lest because, the peasants revolt <laughs> well uh, um, we and, but that's done in the name of not hurting their feelings and one of the things that when i did the singleness as affliction post what the response i got from uh, different people was gratitude thank in other words i i have all this loneliness that I go to church with. And then they ask me to believe a lie on top of it. Yeah. Right? They the this loneliness that I feel that there's something wrong with me mm -hmm. that I feel this way. And if I say no, no, if you if you were missing a leg, if you lost a leg in an auto accident, I don't have to pretend that having one leg is uh, differently abled mm -hmm. you know no it's a handicap it's, That's right. and if i stop lying to you then you then you can receive it as in the providence of god okay this is where i am and then do the best you can with it mm -hmm. at least but you're not having the extra burden of believing a lie Mm. Right. And that's 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 the ministry to these generations that we, we have to have like with the young men like yes there's grounds to be angry mm -hmm. by all means and, uh, and the sexual morality that once was more contained in men has spread to both sexes equally. And in terms of actual engagement with physical people may even be higher in women now than it is with men. Mm -hmm. Men, um, because of men tend to like to do things the easy way when it comes to sex, mm -hmm. they, they are, you Which know. Which is porn. Yeah, porn with the women, actually, they want relational connection. And so it's like a real problem. There's all sorts of reasons to be down and angry, but, but, you know, God, it's not the first time this happened. You know, there's that great book by Stephen Osment, um, When Fathers Ruled. Yeah. And so great, the opening, the op first, first opening chapters of that, you realize, oh, wow, MGTOWs happened before. Men going their own way. That happened where people thought, and people thought women are all, you know, basically succubuses. They're like these evil women. They actually thought that they needed semen 
uh, to keep their w- uh, wombs from drying out, right? Mm-hmm. And they had all this weird mythology around it, but men didn't want to get married, and they had a very low view. Mm-hmm. And part of the Reformation was recapturing the glory of marriage, sex, and family. And we're there again. It's kind of like the Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire uh, broke up, and there's chaos everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, globalism's failing, and there's a lot of chaos, and we're watching our country, and, and the, the, the Catholic, Catholic Church was in well, turbulence, and now even the, the experiment that was evangelicalism of the culture from the 1920s and 30s, that's failed, it's rotten. And now everyone's like, what do we do, where do we go? We're in a very similar moment mm-hmm. um, at some level that we're because, there. Because God in his sovereignty um, practices, believes in and practices creative destruction. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he he shakes things. Well, it says in Hebrews, he shakes things down so that that which cannot be shaken may remain. That's right. And uh, America is going through a shakedown period right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the clown, the clown world of the last two to three years is just one little piece of it. It's been a whole generation. It's been going on for a while. It's been going on for a while, and we are reaping what we have sown. But the church is in the privileged position. If we follow him of being in the land of Goshen while the plagues rain down on Egypt, mm-hmm. we can provide a haven for for people. In the, and I would say, that, and I wonder if you agree with this, when it comes to sexual matters, masculinity and femininity matters, family matters, the, the essential thing for us to do right now is to bring people into the church and tell them the truth. Right. If we just stop telling lies. Stop, yes. Stop telling lies. Yeah. Well, that, and that's the way the book, the name of our book, and now this documentary is It's Good to Be a Man. It's so funny that people thought that was edgy because what I was going for <laughs> was positivity. I'm like, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm not going to like mm-hmm. anger people mm-hmm. anymore. I'm going to be uh, a good person. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't uh, want my wife to have a few friends, you know? Right. Um, so It's Good to Be a Man is just, it's just Genesis. Right, God yeah. made man uh, in His image, male and female. He created them, and it's good to be the sex that God has assigned you, right? right? Um, that male or female, but but that you got to take the extra step. Here's those masculine urges you have when disciplined by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit are good, feminine, all these things, and uh, like you said, I think what was happening with your your singleness post is women are feeling bad for being lonely. Oh, wait, I'm thought. I thought I'm supposed to feel awesome and happy mm-hmm. and I'm living my best life now and all this, and then I don't. Right. So no, it's normal for a woman to want to have a family. That's why do people get, you know, the the cats, right? Yeah. You know, I always tell young couples always get like a puppy dog or a cat. So you could do that or you could, you know, put a baby in that woman, right? right. Like have some children. You right. could do that. But telling people the truth, um, hard truth, and that's that's the problem with kind of the red pill manuscript world. They are speaking truth, but truth without redemption. They're and they're just speaking part of the, to the problem. And then a lot of those guys are, you know, they really are charlatans. That when people are hurting and they're mad, they they shake them down for money. Mm-hmm. And you know, evangelicalism has been using women, single women, in a, a, a long a long time. Just kind of like governments use women because they tend to be more com- compliant, uh, at least at a middle level. And corporations do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Well, evangelicalism has done that. Well, kind of the secular world, you know, has been doing that with these young men. And some of them are much more benevolent. I think guys like Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson mean well. And, and they're mm-hmm. just speaking from their experience. I will say Peterson certainly seems to be making a whole lot of money off of it in a, mm-hmm. in a way that I, I think I prefer Joe Rogan's way, right? You just mm-hmm. make the content and people pay for it, but mm-hmm. I don't like it when, you, when you're shaking down young men. But those are guys like that, and there's other guys that are just seriously, uh, they're commiserating with them and, and t- using their misery. We have to be the people that, that recognize, yes, there's a dark valley. Do not set camp up there. Mm-hmm. You, when you're going through hell, Keep going. Right. Get to the other side, and that's that, that's our our job. That's the, our challenge. Is our time. You know. Yeah. So, um, been great having you here. Uh, look forward to the. Uh, what's the release date? What's the... First week of April, I think. Okay. So uh, we're we're looking forward to. It's good to be a man. The documentary with that includes, I understand, some footage of you chasing a chicken. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, good true. Be, it's going to release the first week of April, and uh, we look forward to it, and it'll be available uh, very, very soon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>